to explore is human. Humans have always ventured beyond the horizon into the unknown. And the sea, with its vastness and all its perils, was once the final frontier. Exploration is a drive to survive, a necessary curiosity, an addiction that has consumed the human species since the dawn of time. With exploration comes migration and colonization. But the urge to explore has forever consumed mankind. Sometimes for glory, sometimes for greed. The Malayo-Polynesians, a maritime people, conquered the seas long before Zheng He, Magellan or Cook. They sailed the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and became one with the sea. This is their journey, the journey of the greatest ancient seafarers, the Malayo-Polynesians. The Malayo-Polynesians are defined by their spoken language, Malayo-Austronesian. They stretch between Madagascar, off the African eastern coast, to as far as Easter Island in the southeast of the Pacific Ocean. Most of them, however, can be found in Southeast Asia, especially in the Malay Archipelago, which includes the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, Borneo, Java, Sulawesi, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. They also populate the Pacific in the Melanesian Islands, the Micronesian Islands, and the Polynesian Islands. These people are renowned for their seafaring and boat building skills that have stood the test of time and brought them to colonize the island of Madagascar many, many miles away. The Pangaea theory hypothesized that the Earth had only one supercontinent before it began splitting up and drifting away to become the Earth and continents we know today. The drifting and the flooding of the Earth by ways of global warming and glacial melting occurred several times within millions of years. The general consensus of geneticists is that the present species of humans, Homo sapiens, began in Africa 160,000 years ago. The first exodus that brought with it the first migration of Homo sapiens spread out from Africa between 80 and 100,000 years ago across India into Southeast Asia. However, prior to Homo sapiens reaching Southeast Asia, the supervolcano Mount Toba decided to erupt. It was the largest explosion in the last two million years, perhaps 100 times larger than the Krakatoa event of southern Sumatra in 1883. The thick and heavy ashes from the Toba covered areas from Sundaland to the Indian subcontinent, destroying almost all life in the area, including the early human population, mostly the Homo erectus. 
But that did not stop humans from venturing on. And soon the Indian subcontinent and then Southeast Asia was repopulated. But this time by our ancestors, the Homo sapiens. Dr. Zilfalil Alwi of University Science Malaysia has been studying and researching the genomic profile of the Negritos of Malaysia. Here, deep in the forests of Klantan, he hopes to be able to complete his mapping of the Negrito DNA. Well, historically, we, we see that the uh, Negrito tribes, they uh, have been in uh, peninsular Malaysia much longer uh, as compared to the uh, proto malays and the Sanoi. The aborigines of uh, peninsular Malaysia, or we call them the Orang Asli, can be divided into three major groups, the Negritos, the Sanoi, and the proto malays They resemble very much uh, the pygmies of the uh, Africa. Uh, they are dark skin, curly hair, uh, uh, and whereas the proto Malay orang asli, they are very much, uh, you know, having a fairer complexion, if you like, you know, uh, and even their hair resembles very much uh, the uh, you know the modern Malays um, that we see in Malaysia today. Sundaland is a large continent located on the equator, a tropical paradise with favorable weather and fertile land. It was abundant with edible flora and fauna for the hunter-gatherers. This is echoed by Professor Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer, a world-renowned expert in the synthesis of DNA studies with archaeological and other evidence to track ancient migrations. He is the writer of Eden in the East, the drowned continent of Southeast Asia. It's important to realize that when people first arrived in Southeast Asia, it was a very different Southeast Asia from the one we see today. In fact, um, it's referred to by geologists and uh, historians now as Sunderland because it was a huge continent which included the whole of the, uh, Indochina, the Malay Peninsula, and uh, Sumatra, Java, Borneo, the Greater Sundas, um, which were all joined together. And um, uh, one could walk all the way down to Bali um, from, uh, from Africa. That's why genetically um, the Malay Peninsula is very similar in many ways, um, not identical to, but very similar in many ways um, to Indonesia and Borneo and, uh, and, and the uh, Philippines. As sea levels were lower then, the continent's coastline extended farther than it does today, toward the island of Timor. But the exploring did not stop altogether in Sundaland, and for reasons unknown, the Homo sapiens crossed a body of water 90 kilometers wide to Sahul, beyond the horizon. This was probably where their seafaring skills were first tested. It's likely that uh, the descendants of these first arrivals became the first seafarers. Now, we have dates in Australia of 50 to 60,000 years uh, for uh, the first human activity and this is modern humans not Homo erectus and to get to Australia uh, they had to cross sea. For that to happen you can't just imagine somebody getting lost on a floating on a log and arriving uh, in uh, the chances are they wouldn't have survived and they certainly wouldn't have been able to provide multiple uh, lineages which clearly have arrived in Australia from Southeast Asia at that time. So uh, I think we have to think about sailing as already being established and had some means of navigating and steering their craft. And to imagine that people did that in dugouts with paddles in open sea is, uh, is very unlikely. They must have had a more complex craft. 
We might never find the origin of the seafaring skills and where the technology began, but we do know that humans were forced to migrate again for reasons of self-preservation. About 18,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, ice sheets in Antarctica began to collapse, caused by global warming. The event created a massive and abrupt rise in the Earth's sea level to over 20 meters. The flooding forced humans to decide. Some ran to the hills and the mountains, while others fled in their boats. Well, a dramatic uh, change occurred in Southeast Asia, and a lot was going on. Um, because from Sunderland, which continent twice the size of India, um, the sea level started rising very rapidly after the last glacial maximum, which occurred around 18,000 years ago, and, and the sea level rise obliterated most of Sunderland, split up uh, the, uh, the islands into Sumatra, Java, Borneo, Bali, and uh, um, all the islands which we're now familiar with uh, as part of Indonesia and, uh, and Borneo. And uh, this happened in three dramatic um, sea level rises, which we really regard as floods. And because the Sunder Shelf was so flat, uh, the sea was actually coming in more than a kilometer every year. So you can imagine that uh, most of these people were living on the coast. They had to live in the houses on stilts because each year the sea was coming in so fast that uh, it would have flooded the floor. And, uh, they, and they would have been relocating uh, their villages inland in order to keep pace with the sea. Eventually this got so, so much they actually had to get on their boats and start moving. And uh, this must have stimulated uh, improvements in sailing technology uh, because they really had to work fast. Eight and a half thousand years ago, it was different because they didn't just expand within uh, island Southeast Asia, they went along the north coast of New Guinea again. And uh, so this was the, the next major intrusion from, in, uh, from Southeast Asia to Melanesia. This whole phase between eight and a half and six thousand years ago um, was the second phase of um, colonization by seagoing craft. It is known that the Malayo-Polynesian people migrated via marine highways, but still archaeologists have yet to find anything maritime that originated from either mainland or insular Southeast Asia beyond 3,000 years ago. The only evidence to show that there were great sea voyages came from a very unlikely source, a non-maritime object, obsidian. It was used by uh, ancient people mainly because it's like glass, sharp, and then it's uh, easily walkable. This is an excellent example from Bukit Tengkorak. This piece is dated uh, 3,000 years ago, and uh, it's flagged from an obsidian coal and uh, probably used uh, as a composite knife and it still has very sharp edges. It's usually mounted on a piece of uh, wood. Obsidian to the people in uh, Tengkora especially, where the source is non-existent so far, would be, would be considered rare and precious. And uh, it must have been traded in from uh, Melanesia, the source, possibly the pottery that they produce at Tengkora in exchange for the, uh, the obsidian. The idea of making pottery may have been brought from Southeast Asia to uh, um, the Bismarcks and so, so it's, it is an interaction between Southeast Asia and, uh, and the Bismarcks. This 
lengths of um, trading um, has been found to be the longest trading route in the world for the Neolithic period. And we're not surprised because if you look at the um, Bajau Laut, they travel long distances with their boats uh, and uh, the things that the ceramics or the pottery that they made in Bukit Tengkora was uh, mostly uh, stoves for them to use in their boats during these long journeys. This is Sampurna in Sabah, Malaysia, on the island of Borneo. Perhaps the Bajau people that still live around this area are direct descendants of these ancient seafaring traders. Tom Hugevost, an Oxford scholar, has done numerous linguistic studies of the Bajau language and has been living with them for some time. Though he humbly claims that he only knew just a trickle about the legacy of the Bajau, his search would prove to be an insight into their world. Today, more and more of them are settling down, some on land, but mostly in villages located on the water in coastal areas of Sabah, Sulawesi, and many more. Do you think this uh, lifestyle is still going to be there in a couple of years? Well, I'm sure this is some sort of uh, lifestyle is still there uh, as long as these people are still sticking to what actually their culture is. But development will eventually erase the history of these people. But I hope they will still stick to it. But you think uh, these people might be the last uh, true... I'm sure these people are class. the last seafarers people in this part of the world. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they still survive and they will still be around for years to come. Well, they have two terms. They would use... Uh, Bajo is the term used by outsiders, whereas they would call themselves summer. So they're very maritime oriented. They uh, travel around to several places. They don't really belong to one country. So you have them in uh, Malaysia, um, the southern Philippines, Indonesia, and they travel around. So they're highly mobile. And I think that's why people started uh, referring to them as gypsies, uh, as something that they knew from uh, the Western world. They are indigenous to insular Southeast Asia and have been living this lifestyle for centuries now. And one of the pieces of evidence is Bukit Tengkora in Sabah, um, where shell remains have been found. Um, and they prepare those shells in the same way um, today. From the archaeological record, it transpires that the early inhabitants of the uh, region that is now called Bukit Tengkora lived a lifestyle which is highly similar to the modern Bajau lifestyle. So, the long-distance maritime trade that we see in the archaeological record suggests that the Bajau lifestyle might be that old, which is at least 3,000 years old. They might have been engaged in the same um, inter-ethnic trade that we see today. Kayu ya pak. Kayu. Oke kayu. Ini, ini hmm. untuk yang, yang longgarnya ini jadi yeah. kalau sudah mereka serapat yang ini nih. Bapak-bapak hmm. belajar uh, 
membuat perahu tradisional itu? Kalau eh, tempat belajarnya tidak ada cuma keberanian saja. Hmm. Jadi sini tidak ada belajar uh, spesial uh, sekolah untuk tidak bikin ada sekolah, ini tidak ya? ada. Hmm. Jadi lihat uh, kakek, bapak, ke anak hmm. terus secara Well, they, uh, the boat builders here make traditional boats, they sell them, and it's one other um, way to live. They can either sell and build boats or they can go fishing, and most people here know both of them, and they learn it um, basically by looking at other people doing it. So they sort of grew up with it. Everybody in this village is somehow related, so they learn it from their ancestors, and basically by looking around and seeing other people doing it. The boat still uses wooden packs, like this one, and that is a tradition that goes back for several centuries. But then it's not really traditional in the way that the planks are also fastened by iron uh, nails, which is a modern, relatively modern development. So they basically have um, an original way of building boats, but they also incorporate modern uh, developments in it. It may not be conclusive that the Bajau of the present were the same people that fled from the flooding Sundaland and then migrated to Melanesia and later populated the Pacific, but it does seem clear that these people do have the boat building capabilities that perhaps enabled them to trade in faraway lands, such as New Britain in the Bismarck Archipelago. This interaction might not only have been the trading of potteries and obsidian, but may also have resulted in breeding. And that all starts around 8,000 years ago, at the same time as our new genetic data indicates that there was a long distance uh, movement, probably in stages, from Southeast Asia, from the Indonesian region, to the Bismarcks. From Africa, they reached Melanesia, and the next new frontier was the Pacific. There were many reasons for this migration push, but the real drive was exploration. About 10,000 years ago, the hunter-gatherers from Africa had the technology to build seaworthy boats and had grasped the navigational skills needed for sea exploration. Three and a half thousand years ago, when there was the most dramatic uh, expansion uh, of prehistory, uh, suddenly from uh, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, and the rest of uh, Polynesia being empty, around three and a half to three thousand years ago, we suddenly find people everywhere in the Pacific. They have moved from uh, from Melanesia. Uh, dramatically out to Fiji, to Samoa, uh, to New Caledonia, to Vanuatu and not only that they've invented uh, a new kind of pottery it's called Lapita pottery which they take with them so uh, not only do we see the genetic evidence of expansion three and a half thousand years ago uh, very clearly co correlating with the the archaeology of this dramatic expansion uh, but we actually see the pottery indicating that the same culture is moving in different directions. Interestingly, it's not the same people, because the Polynesians look slightly different from the people of Vanuatu and New Caledonia. Uh, the latter look uh, more like the people of, of New Guinea. The great distances between islands in the Pacific and the same weather conditions of the past pose challenges even to present-day seafarers with modern navigational instruments and current technologies at their disposal. One can only assume, therefore, that the ancient mariners must have had advanced technology in sailing, navigation and boat building capabilities, even before they made their decision to explore beyond the horizons. And of course, to get to all these island groups like the Solomons, Vanuatu and New Caledonia, people had to sail. Uh, this, this is really the most amazing uh, event. Now, for that to happen, there must have been a dramatic technological change uh, in, in the quality of sailing, the quality of the sailing boats they were using, and in the quality of their navigation. 
because they were really going over huge distances now. They had to cross large stretches of ocean, uh, open ocean. And uh, the longer those stretches were, the more difficult it was to cross. And so the oldest migrations um, only got so far in Melanesia. And the younger migrations just covered the whole Pacific. Today, most migration theorists agree that voyages between the islands of the Pacific were regular, planned voyages that were not based on haphazard fleeing or drifting, but more on transportation, colonizing, and trading. Discoveries in Sungai Batu showed a great civilization that thrived on export of iron abroad. With its magnificent iron furnace and its jetties, Sungai Batu was a great destination of trade around 1,700 years ago. Professor Mukta Saidin, director of the Center of Global Archaeological Research, University Science Malaysia, who has been excavating the Sungai Batu site since early 2009, explains. This is a new site we had just excavated two months ago under the third phase of a Sungai Batu excavation. We found another evidence of iron smelting with a lot of uh, furnish, remain of furnish, more than 2,000 of two years, and a lot majority of iron slags. This is an example of iron anger. Okay, this one of the product that they want to export. There is not a lot here, but majority is iron slag, but we have the iron anger, very heavy. Okay, Another one is the evidence of two years. It's made from clay, round shape, it's about 8 inch long, and a small hole at the center. You know, this is a tool to help the workers to pump in the air to make the high temperature. As we all know, iron needs more than 1,000 degrees Celsius to smell. Based on our record right now, from Tamil record and Arab record, showed that the iron was export until Arab and also until India to make a sword. Even Al-Kindi mentioned the best three iron in the world one of that from Kalah. Kalah is Arabic for Kedah Tua. So it's really fulfilled the interpretation before by historian, now by the archaeologists with the new evidence of ions. We found right now eight JT structure throughout the old river. It's really a big complex. A lot of people, at least uh, five to 6,000 people around with the industry and to export the iron. We export the iron, it's really very, very heavy. Really need a good, good quality ship so that it can be transported. About 2,000 years before present, the Chinese recorded the advanced Southeast Asian seafaring technology. In fact, it could be the first written records of it. The records mention ships from Southeast Asia called Kunlun Bo that visited Chinese harbors and took Buddhist pilgrims on board en route to religious sites within the Sri Vijaya Kingdom. Associate Professor Dr. Pisol Maidin has been studying the evolution of watercraft in the Southeast Asian region, with the focus of his research being traditional boat building techniques and technologies. Uh, mungkin orang meragui uh, bolehkah ada kapal yang dibina daripada kayu sebesar kapal yang digambarkan oleh rekod-rekod Cina yang dikenali dengan nama Kulun Bo itu uh, memang sehingga hari ini sangat kurang uh, tinggalan-tinggalan arkeologi tentang kapal-kapal besar ditemui uh, saya fikir yang paling besar uh, 
ditemui adalah tinggalan sebuah kapal yang panjangnya adalah sekitar 30 meter di Sumatera. Walaupun itu tidaklah cukup besar untuk memuatkan ribuan penumpang. Tetapi kalau kita lihat rekod-rekod dan kita lihat evolusi perahu ataupun kapal Melayu, kita mungkin dapat memberi sedikit justifikasi yang adil kepada rekod-rekod Cina tadi. Misalnya, apabila Alfonso di Albuke sampai ke Melaka ataupun dalam perjalanan ke Melaka, dia telah bertemu dengan sebuah jong milik putera Raja Pasai. Dan dalam surat ataupun rekod yang ditulis oleh Alfonso di Albuke sendiri, dia mengatakan bahawa saiz jong itu adalah tiga kali ganda lebih besar daripada kapal Flor di Lama. Ini adalah satu saiz yang sangat besar. Jadi anda boleh bayangkan jika Jung Melaka, Jung Melayu adalah tiga kali ganda daripada saiz Flor di Lama, bayangkan betapa besarnya perahu Jung Melayu. The Chinese canoned another observation of these seafaring technologies. A Buddhist monk wrote, "The bow are sea-going ships." They could carry more than 1,000 men, apart from cargo. They lie six or seven feet in the water, and they are fast. Many of those who form the crew and technicians are Southeast Asian people. With fibrous bark of the coconut tree, they make cords which bind the parts of the ship together. There are no clamps or nails for fear that heating the iron would give rise to fires. The ships are constructed by assembling several thickness of side planks, for the boards are thin and they fear they would break. Their length is over 60 meters, and the ships cannot be propelled by the strength of men. And that was almost 900 years before the great Admiral Zheng He and more than a millennium before Magellan. The period between the 3rd and 10th century saw the reign of Malay empires around Southeast Asia, especially the Sri Vijaya Empire, which covers most of the Malay archipelago. As mentioned by the Arabs, the Tamils, and also Potlami, the Roman historian, the Sri Vijaya Empire had strong trade links with them. But it was not just iron they were exporting. In fact, they were exporting humans, too. Though it was based in Sumatra, it was alleged that the Sri Vijaya Empire was responsible for driving the people of Burrito into trading ships and therefore contributed to the migration of not just the people, but also the language of the Malayo-Polynesians to Madagascar in the West. It's true that Madagascar is, is much closer to Africa than to Asia, but it's really surprising that, that there are a lot of influences, Asian influences, in Madagascar rather than African influences. If only from a linguistic, cultural, and perhaps even a facial traits perspective, which shows that there are there was a whole marine current that brought people from Malaysia and even from Polynesia up to Madagascar. It is important to rethink the process of dispersal and colonization of islands in the Pacific, where voyages involved great and perilous distances, and most of the journeys were against prevailing winds and currents. Today, many of us could never imagine how it was possible for the ancient seafarer to explore into the unknown without navigational instruments. Not long ago, it was hypothesized that human migration into the Pacific was purely accidental. 
drifting with currents or simply lost at sea. The replicated voyaging canoe, the double-hulled 19-meter Hokulea, has now made numerous experimental non-instrument navigated voyages between many Polynesian archipelagos, with the most dramatic being a voyage from Mangareva to the remote Easter Island in 1999. This experimental archaeology has shown the world that the ancient Malayo-Polynesian seafarers had the knowledge of navigation and the intention to explore the unknown. Nainoa Thompson, the navigator of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, explains. Um, one of the things that Hokulea did, it challenged us to find out how much we didn't know. And so the, um, one of those challenges, okay, we built the Voyaging Canoe, but who is going to navigate it? The story I know was that in 1969, they found a navigator by the name of Tevake uh, on the island of Santa Cruz. And um, uh, they had asked him to, to guide Hokulea, when, and Hokulea wasn't even constructed yet. Um, but anyway, Tevake had passed away. So, so at that point in time, in my lifetime, even though I didn't know him, that was extinction. That was the end. Maybe 3,000 years legacy of the teachings and the recordings and the, and the remembering of, of the great navigators gone. And so I don't think anybody really knew when that day happened how much we were at risk culturally, uh, losing the last navigator. But, but Hokulea has a very special kind of extraordinary gravity where we found another navigator, not from Micronesia, I mean not from Polynesia, but from Micronesia. There were only six left on the earth, and he was the youngest. And he comes from an island called Satawa in the Central Carolines on Micronesia. And, uh, and his name is Mao Pialu. Mao Pialu was the last remnant of the wayfinding navigators. Wayfinding is a non instrument method of navigating deep sea voyages based on whatever the elements of the sea and the sky can provide to the navigator. 1976, he sails Hokulea to Tahiti, first voyage in 600 years, changes everything. Uh, he takes it back into an island group that one are native speakers first. Uh, they have their orations, they have the genealogy, they talk about the great voyaging canoes, they talk about the great navigators, but they don't have the canoe or the navigators. So when Hokulea arrives, it's, you find it's their canoe. And what it did for us, it relinked us back uh, across the Pacific as family. And, and, and that was a fun, foundational change for the Hawaiian community and for Hawaii. Couldn't be done without money. Islands such as Satawal, an atoll located in the Federated States of Micronesia, is only slightly more than one and a half square miles without lagoons nor shelter, little dots on the Pacific Ocean. Such islands were the only savior of this long lost art and the sole evidence of the Malayo-Polynesian ancestral seafaring brilliance of the past. We think the navigation survived because colonial powers of the Spanish and the Germans and the Japanese and the Americans had no interest in, a, in an island that had no lagoon where they, could, where they could anchor ships. Mao was trained by his grandfather probably since the day he was born. Mao was selected by his grandfather on his island to learn the navigation because they keep it in the family because navigation knowledge is power. At an old age of five he was on the voyage of canoe with his grandfather and the wave make the canoe go up and down and it, he get seasick. His grandfather would tie him by rope, hands by rope, and throw him overboard and drag him. And, and, and I mean if you did that in our society you would be in jail immediately but he talked about his grandfather in great kindness. That grandfather throws me in the water, he throws me so I can go inside the wave. When I go inside the wave, I become the wave. When I become the wave, I become navigator. So, 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 it's the, so that navigation is not just intellectual, it's not just academic training, it's about this relationship with the ocean. Everything about the ocean world at sea potentially helps the navigator. 
his understanding and confidence about where you're going on the ocean, where you are in the ocean, is um, something that we just simply are not there yet. The knowledge and skills of navigation and boat building was always handed down from father to son to grandson. But when there was no one left to pass the knowledge on to, the knowledge and the skills also died with the elders. The tradition of orally passing down of knowledge is endemic within the Malayo-Polynesian domain. This is due to the fact that it was rather late for the inception of a written language, even though a similar language was spoken throughout. But still, it is through this tradition that most of the navigational skills and also the boat building technologies have survived till today. And to ensure that this tradition will survive into the future, more and more of these master navigators and master craftsmen have started to pass it down to not only their family members, but students, pupils, apprentices, and others who have the interest and the courage. <laughs> This is Pulau Duyong on the east coast of the Malay Peninsula. It was a renowned center for traditional boat building in Southeast Asia, but it is slowly diminishing and is in danger of being lost in the near future. Here we meet Pak Hassan. He is the son of the only Malay boat builder to have built a traditional sailing ship that has circumnavigated the globe. <laughs> Christoph Swaboda, the captain who co-built and once owned the Naga Palangi one, tells of his experience and why he put his trust and life into the hands of a Malayo-Polynesian boat builder. The Malays uh, are definitely some of the greatest boat builders that ever uh, existed. Malays use to build wooden boats is, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. They built the boats from the outside to the inside. They built them without frames in the beginning. They put the planks together, like you see here in the example, with wooden dowels. So this is the size of the planks of the Naga Pelangi. Wooden dowels hold them together and they are separated by what the Malays call Kulit Gelam, the bark of a tree. That is their, their corking. This is a technique which is only known in the Malay cultural area, which is probably thousands of years old, goes probably back to the first migrations of the, of, of the Malays when they colonized the Malay archipelago and the, the islands far away. However, there are many circumstances that the tradition has had to endure. Some are encouraging, and some are rather threatening. Sekarang nampak keadaan sekarang ni oleh oleh kerana kayu dan kelapa tinggi pun dia mungkin orang tak mampu. Sekarang ni kayu tiga belas ataupun lima belas ribu satu tang. Orang kurang berkemampuan, tidak tidak berkemampuan. Berapa tinggi harga? Tepuhan tak ada sangat ni. Luar negara pun sekarang ni dah tak ada ni kurang. After I finished my circumnavigation, arriving in Duyong, for me it was very sad to see that the boat building industry was on the decline. Of the ones 30 or 40 yards that were in Duyong and Trangano, only three or four had survived. 
Ha, dulu dulu masa saya kecil-kecil kalau nak pergi bandar pun naik bot penambang lah. Pasal jabatan dulu Pulau Duyah tak, tak ada lah. Ha, kenapa lah tukar bot apa kau duduk naik bot tu kita nampak. Ha, sini bot lah tu ambil tempat, ha, tempat ha, pak cik ni, sini tempat pak cik ni. Ha. Ha, tukang bot Pulau Duyah dulu ha, banyak. Tapi, ha. Tapi sekarang dah kurang sikit lah. Generasi lah pasal generasi orang tua yang dah meninggal apa. Dari sekarang ni tukang di Pulau Duyah pun ada. Duduk empat lima orang yang tukang tapi masa pak cik muda dulu di pradio ni mungkin ada 10 bengkel dulu dulu pasal tu dia tu tukang buat buat ramai pekerja pun ramai banyak tempat di pradio ni dia tukang mungkin makin pupus the boat builders of pulau duyong have been building boats for ages they built ships of the phoenici type buda type smaller sekochi and kolek type all around Pulau Duyong. From 30 or more master craftsmen, now only a handful are left. Some say that circumstances such as the price of Chungal wood has killed the industry, which is quite true. But worse is that the new generation looks on boat building as nothing but a laborer's job. Madagascar is located 250 miles off the eastern coast of Africa, but it may not be the most remote island within the Malayo-Polynesian world. But it is the farthest by distance from its closest Malayo-Polynesian neighbor, the Sumatran island of the Indonesian Republic. It's true that Madagascar is, is much closer to Africa than to Asia, but it's really surprising that, that there are a lot of influences, Asian influences, in Madagascar rather than African influences, if only from a linguistic, cultural, and perhaps even a facial traits perspective which shows that there are there was a whole marine current that brought people from Malaysia and even from Polynesia up to Madagascar Madagascar is only a few hundred kilometers from the African continent and its most surprising originality is found in its cultural and historical aspects the Malagash language, spoken by the entire population, belongs to the family of the Malayo-Austronesian language. The language most closely related to Malagash is the Manyan of the Greater Burrito East group of the Malayo-Austronesian language family. To, with regard to the relationship, the link between Madagascar and the Malaysian world, particularly in terms of languages, there's the relationship between languages because as you know Managash is part of the Malaysian slash Polynesian languages. In the research that we've carried out we've noted from observed from the research done by our predecessors, Otto Christian Dahl, Philippe Aujard, Deschamps, we were able to note down 220 words of Malaysian origin. And, for example, for these words of Malaysian origin, I could mention Vatu. In the Malaysian word, world, Batu. For example, Menaka. In the Malaysian world, it's called Miyak. There are several words. And, in addition to the words, there's also religion. Hence, the respect of ancestors, respecting ancestors, for example, in the large funerals, the Famadian, the second funerals, Famadian in Madagascar, you can see that in Slawesi and Borneo.
Related languages are also spoken in Sulawesi, Malaysia and Sumatra. Talk about weaving. In Managash we say tin. In Malaysia you say tinun. And, and there are several other cultural traits from a physical perspective, uh, for example, morphology. In the Malaysian world, there aren't a lot of very, very tall people. And it's the same thing in Madagascar. There are some on, on the coast, but most Madagash are, are rather short. And also, in terms of skin tone, pigmentation. There's a certain resemblance with the Malaysian world. Also, for example, the musical instrument. And there's also the alwal that you find with the ma'afal that you also find in the Malaysian world, which shows that there's a a major affinity between Madagascar and the Malaysian world. Discoveries in Sungai Batu showed a great civilization that thrived on export of iron abroad. With its magnificent iron furnace and its jetties, Sungai Batu was a great destination of trade around 1,700 years ago. Professor Mukta Saidin, Director of the Centre of Global Archaeological Research, University Science Malaysia, who has been excavating the Sungai Batu site since early 2009, explains. This is a new site. We just excavated two months ago under the third phase of a Sungai Batu excavation. We found another evidence of iron smelting with a lot of uh, furnish, remain of furnish, more than 2,000 of two years, and a lot majority of iron slags. This is an example of iron angle. Okay, this one of the product that they want to export. There is not a lot here, but majority is iron slag, but we have the iron angle, very heavy. Okay. Another one is the evidence of two years. It's make it made from clay. Round shape is about eight inch long and a small hole at the center. You know, this is a tool to help the workers to pump in the air to make the high temperature. As we all know, iron needs more than 1,000 degrees Celsius to smell. Based on our record right now, from Tamil record and Arab record, showed that the iron was export until Arab and also until India to make a sword. Even Al-Kindi mentioned the best three iron in the world one of that from Kalah. Kalah is Arabic for Kedah Tua. So it's really fulfilled the interpretation before by historian, now by the archaeologists with the new evidence of ions. We found right now eight JT structure throughout the old river. It's really a big complex. A lot of people, at least uh, five to 6,000 people around with the industry and to export the iron. We export the iron, it's really very, very heavy. Really need a good, good quality ship so that it can be transported. Discoveries in archaeological sites such as Sungai Batu in northern Malaysia gave evidence that the Malayo-Polynesians not only possessed the skills to build big and strong boats to carry iron ingots across the ocean, but were also frequent traders along the Indian coast to the Arabs and may even have traded with the Romans, as mentioned by Claudius Potlamy, who wrote about Kedda, which he called Chersonesus Aurea, loosely interpreted 
as the Peninsula of Gold. However, Manyan is spoken by a population that lives along the Burita River in Kalimantan, and they did not possess the necessary skills for long maritime navigation. This brings about the allegation that the Manyan speakers are only secondary seafarers who were driven into trading ships by the more powerful Malayo-Polynesian seafarers who did possess the boat building and navigational skills needed to cross the vast Indian Ocean to Madagascar. In order to be able to complete the great voyage between Borneo to Madagascar, the Malayo-Polynesian seafarers would need a truly seaworthy boat that could carry many people who possibly became the founders in Madagascar. The enigma of the Malayo-Polynesian seafarers voyaging to Madagascar has always been the opposite of the Malayo-Polynesian seafarers of the Pacific. The navigational skill of the Pacific's Malayo-Polynesians has enabled them to sail against the prevailing wind and across vast oceans. However, voyages toward Madagascar were either by coastal route via India, Persia, the Arab Peninsula and Eastern Africa, or drifting with currents and prevailing winds that could have carried their boats towards Madagascar. In fact, there is an Indian Ocean current that connects Sumatra with Madagascar. When Mount Krakatoa erupted in 1883, pumice was washed ashore on Madagascar's east coast where the Mananjari River opens into the sea. And also, during World War II, the same area saw the arrival of pieces of wreckage from ships sailing between Java and Sumatra that had been bombed by the Japanese Air Force. It is claimed that boats could have easily passed the Sunda Strait and entered the current that would eventually carry them to the east coast of Madagascar. But whatever the theories were, it will always be the seaworthiness of the boats that carried them to landfall, and in this case, Madagascar. In the Pacific, the replicated experimental double-hulled 19-meter voyaging canoe Hokulea was rebuilt to prove their great seafaring ancestry. And thus, the Borobudur ship is more evidence of the Malayo-Polynesian seafaring capability. It is an 8th century wooden double outrigger sailed vessel of maritime Southeast Asia, depicted in some of bas reliefs of the Borobudur Buddhist monument in central Java, Indonesia. Kapal ini adalah kapal yang sekarang kita lihat adalah kapal yang digunakan untuk berlayar sampai di Madagaskar. Kemarin sudah dicoba untuk melintasi semua benua itu, termasuk lintasan benua India. Itu sudah satu bukti bahwa ini memang bisa menggunakan layar yang uh, digunakan yang seperti kita lihat di kapal ini. Jadi untuk kapal Samudra Raksa ini adalah salah satu bukti, salah satu bukti terkuat untuk orang-orang Indonesia bahwa Indonesia itu dari dulu adalah orang-orang yang suka berlayar untuk mengunjungi dari 17.000 pulau yang ada, terutama dari Jawa, Sumatera dan juga ke negara-negara tetangga sampai di Madagaskar, India, Australia, sampai Timur Tengah. Jadi kapal ini sangat penting karena digunakan untuk membangun semangat kembali seperti zaman dulu. Sampai sekarang pun orang-orang masih menggunakan kapal ini untuk berlayar ke pulau satu ke pulau lain. Seperti alat transportasi yang paling mudah dan paling aman. Karena untuk semua penduduk Indonesia itu sebagian besar tinggal di pesisir yang mereka uh, mata penjahiran sebagai pelaut. 
dan juga pada masa-masa perdagangan pada abad ke-5 sampai abad ke-12 kita menggunakan perdagangan pokoknya melalui kapal dagang internasional yaitu menggunakan kapal. The ships depicted on Borobudur were most likely the type of vessels used for inter-insular trade and naval campaigns by the Sri Vijayan Empire that ruled the region between the 7th and 13th centuries. Philip Beale, the head of the Borobudur ship expedition, tells us about what prompted him to realize this big dream. Well, the thing that's really prompted me to do this is that uh, when I was about 17 or 18, I was first out in the Pacific. I got enchanted by the canoe cultures and watercraft of the, the region. And, uh, and later I found out about the uh, Indonesian influence of Madagascar and Africa. And I thought it would be uh, a tremendous challenge to see how they actually reached Africa. And uh, having then found the right craft, this is really putting a, a 20 year old dream uh, into practice. Guided by local knowledge and the Borobudur bas relief, the Borobudur ship was built in replica. Master builder Pat Hassan of Madura was given the responsibility of constructing the Borobudur ship replica that was designed by Nick Burlingham. We're building the ship has been particularly difficult. There's no modern stem and stern post. The ends of the ship are, are just carved to shape out of, out of logs, in effect, and brought together at the ends. Now, that's, uh, there's been some learning involved in that, and there's been some pieces rejected because they didn't fit as well as they might have. But it's now going extremely well. I think uh, another 10 days, we'll, we'll have more or less a, a hull to look at. Within a month, it'll be a complete shell. Traditional methods were employed in building the ship. Ancient Malayo-Polynesian boat building technologies were strictly followed. The boat was built using the plank-on-plank -plank hull construction technique and wooden dowels pegging. In the, uh, the two months since you were here last, the hull has gone from being, what, seven or eight planks to completion. Today there was a ceremony for the completion of the hull. There's still work to do on the cabin and things, but the, the strong, robust hull that will go through the waves is now built. It was a totally opposite system, where the hull was constructed first and the frame inserted later. This method is a proven technology, even by today's standards. Bagaimana sangat ini? Sangat gembira sekali. Sangat senang sekali. Saya juga begitu. Bapak Asad says that he feels very excited and pleased and happy. The experimental expedition took place during the six months from August 2003 until February 2004. Started in Tanjung Priok Harbour, Jakarta on the 30th of August 2003, it arrived in the port of Tema, Accra, Ghana on the 23rd of February 2004. The epic voyage demonstrated the ancient trading links between Indonesia and Africa, in particular East Africa and Madagascar. The treacherous cinnamon shipping route took vessels from Indonesian waters across the Indian Ocean, past the Seychelles, Madagascar and South Africa to Ghana. During the epic voyage, the ship proved its seaworthiness. It may be crude looking, but the ship endured all the challenges the sea could throw at her, with flair and a smile.
I'm used to modern yachts. I'm used to being able to sail up wind and go where I want to go. I'm used to be able to turn the engine on when things get tough. And uh, and this is different. And this is purely using the elements and sailing as it was and maybe as it should be um, to get to eventually where you want to go. Even though the Borobudur ship was replicated to the traditional design, its voyage was completed with the use of navigational instruments. This, however, did not really represent the ancient navigational skills that were the core of the ancient Malayo-Polynesian seafarers. On the other side of the Earth, in the Pacific, the Hokulea has now made numerous experimental, non-instrument navigated voyages between many Polynesian archipelagos, with the most dramatic voyage being a voyage from Mangareva to remote Easter Island in 1999. The Hokulea measures 61 feet and could carry between 12 to 16 crew. It has no auxiliary motors, but is capable of sailing at speeds of 4 to 6 knots, while reaching 12 to 25 knots in trade winds. This experimental archaeology has shown the world that the ancient Malayo-Polynesian seafarers have all the intention and knowledge of navigation to explore the unknown. Nainoa Thompson, the navigator of the Polynesia Voyaging Society, explains. The navigation and the navigator are the same thing. And, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way you conduct one's whole life and it's a way you see the whole world. It shapes everything about you. Some interesting parts about the education in navigation. Mao was selected by his grandfather on his island to learn the navigation because they keep it in the family. Because navigation knowledge is power. And, uh, and power, you have to be responsible for it. And so at age one, he was put in different parts of that island. The island's only like a mile and a quarter long and half a mile wide. There's no lagoon. And, and that's why the, we think the navigation survived because colonial powers of the Spanish and the Germans and the Japanese and the Americans had no interest in, a, in an island that had no lagoon where they could, where they could anchor ships. So. Um, he was put and played in these tide pools at age one. At an old age of five, he was on the voyage of canoe with his grandfather. And he'll tell me stories. And these stories are important to know how he knows uh, and, and which gets, sheds light on the ancient navigators. He said if he's on the canoe, he's five years old, and the wave makes the canoe go up and down, and it, he gets seasick, his grandfather would tie him by rope, hands by rope, and throw him overboard and drag him. And, 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 I mean, if you did that in our society, you would be in jail immediately. But he talked about his grandfather in great kindness. That grandfather throws me in the water. He throws me so I can go inside the wave. When I go inside the wave, I become the wave. When I become the wave, I become navigator. In the navigation, you have to have some sense of time. You've got to have some sense of, uh, of speed of the, of, of the vessel, and you've got to have some sense uh, of direction. You have to have a very good sense of direction. So when you, when you look at the issue of time, we look at we look passage of heavenly bodies, sun and the moon in the daytime, and then uh, in the daylight hours, and then the stars at night, or the moon at night, or planets. Um, if you look at speed of the canoe, it's more educated intuition over time. You just 
You know how fast you're going by just how it feels and how it sees the water pass from the front to the end. But telling direction is really including, um, let's take it at the beginning, sunrise. You know, the navigator knows where the sun comes up and on its bearing at the sea throughout the year. Um, so when he knows where the sun's coming up, uh, he names it on the star compass. The star compass is that mental construct. Is try to imagine now that you're on open ocean and you got 360 degrees of water. Try to imagine that we divide the, the ocean horizon into 30 different, what we call star houses, the points on the ocean. And that is defined by certain steering stars that rise and set at certain places on the horizon that defines and gives us direction. We use, so we use the sun comes up in different star, star houses throughout the year, um, but it's cyclic, it's an annual cycle. And so if you know the cycle, you can tell where the sun is all year long. The moon, so the, so the, the sun will go through one cycle in one year, the moon does the same thing in one month. And so during the day, we look at the rising and setting of the sun and the rising and setting of the moon if it's available. In the middle of the day when the sun's too high, when it's about like around the 9 a.m. time period to about the 3 a.m. time period when it's passing overhead, what you need to do is read this. And this is the most important thing about the navigator, is reading the wave. Because the wave will help you get through the, um, the middle of the day. So, so when the sun comes up, you set your course. Let's say we're gonna go, let's imagine we're going to Tahiti, we're heading south. So the sun's rising in the east, we keep it, keep it on our port side, our left side. And we study the waves, the wave patterns. When the sun gets too high, we steer by the, by the same pattern. We keep the canoe inside the pattern of the wave that was there at sunrise. And so we keep the course. When the sun gets low, we use the sun again. Um, and basically, the sun's too high now because there's too much sparkle in the water. When the sun gets lower, that whole sparkle is going to come and combine into a more of a narrow light. And that we, we use, we look at where that narrow light is and how broad it is, and we start to steer by the sun again. And then nighttime, by name, we use about 220 stars. So that's 220 rising places and 220 setting places. So it's like 440 opportunities to steer, to give us clues of bearing. The thing about having to, you only know where you are by memorizing where you come from, that requires you to be awake. You can't sleep eight hours a day. On average, our navigators are on this deck um, 21, 22 hours a day for 25 days. That's, uh, and the, that's the other thing that Mao taught us. You have to be able to find rest even though you're awake. For them, memory was everything. And, uh, and, and so, again, it, it's just part of, the, a part of that, I would call that genius. Tupaya, uh, my understanding, Cook was amazed because he could map almost 300 islands. And phenomenal. We say it's phenomenal, but that is just understanding the, you know, the, the power of the human mind. The best of, of, of being humankind, and that is to explore, to discover, to uncover, to, to reach out. Go to places that, that, that you've never been to and, and try to get to places that you can't get to. However, the Hokulea was not built with traditional material. It was constructed with plywood, fiberglass and resin. The only traditionally built Malayo-Polynesian boat constructed with traditional material that has circumnavigated the globe was the Naga Palangi 1. It was built in Pulau Duyong, Tringanu in the early 80s and circumnavigated the earth. Christoph Swaboda, the captain who co-built and once owned the Naga Palangi 1, tells of his experience and why he put his trust and life into the hands of a Malayo-Polynesian boat builder. The Malays uh, are definitely some of the greatest boat builders that ever uh, existed. Malays use to build wooden boats is, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. They built the boats from the outside to the inside. They built them without frames in the beginning there. Put the planks together, like you see here in the example. 
with wooden dowels. So this is the size of the planks of the Naga Pelangi. Wooden dowels hold them together and they are separated by what the Malays call Kulit Gelam, the bark of a tree. That is their, their corking. This is a technique which is only known in the Malay cultural area, which is probably thousands of years old, goes probably back to the first migrations of the, of, of the Malays when they colonized the Malay archipelago and the, the islands far away. The boat builders of Pulau Duyong have been building boats for ages. They built ships of the Phoenici type, Buddha type, smaller Sokochi and Kolek type, all around Pulau Duyong. Naga Pelangi 1 was a bedo, which means it's a double ender. She was 45 foot over deck. We had no ship's toilet. We had just a board in the back, which use, we were using uh, on the poop deck as a, as a toilet. We had no electricity. We had no running water. It was very, very basic. And why I chose the bedo? When I went to Bali to meet Jerry, the sailor who taught me to sail, we sailed on the Burung Bari for two months, no engine, no nothing. And there I, I learned that the Bedo, the double ender, the classic double ender, is supposed to be the most seaworthy boat of all boats. And my decision was made, yes, to go around the world and do some extensive sailing, it must be a Bedo. Later, Swoboda took the traditional rigged vessel from port to port, from seas to oceans, in order to fulfill his dream of becoming a blue water sailor. Actually, after I had the boat, we sailed around Southeast Asia for three years just to familiarize ourselves with the boat, to get comfortable with it. After we felt comfortable, I thought, well, uh, let's see some challenges. Let's see if we can become blue water sailors. So we ventured into the Indian Ocean and uh, set sails towards Europe. Going up the Red Sea, it was a big challenge because the wind practically always comes from the north and you have to go to the north. And the winds are strong, so the boat was beating for many, many, many days, almost weeks, which was a very exhausting experience. And when we arrived in Europe, there was a new frontier, the Caribbean, so we went to the Caribbean. And naturally, from the Caribbean, the next step would be Hawaii. We had a friend in Hawaii, so I went to Hawaii, and then in the end, uh, after Hawaii, another experience when we came across the Pacific near Guam, we went into the outskirts, we met a, hurri uh, a beginning hurricane. We had to hove two in 50 knots of wind, and uh, we were very impressed about with the quality of the boat. She was riding the waves gracefully, not a single wave coming overboard. There was spray coming over because the wind is driving hard. She was laying hove to for two days, beautifully. <laughs> it was, we felt safe and after that I, I knew that this boat can take on anything. It may have taken Swoboda and the Naga Polangi one many years to circumnavigate the globe. But that journey was undisputed proof that the Malayo-Polynesian traditional boat building technology, ancient as it was, was still ingenious, dependable and truly remarkable. The Malays uh, are definitely some of the greatest boat builders that ever uh, existed. Just to give you one example, when I built the first boat, I came with no knowledge of boat building, but as a typical Westerner, I came with my boat building books, uh, the, just to check these villagers building these boats. So I watched Jay Ali, the old master, raising the lingi, the stem post, and he only eyeballed it and told the people, yes, a little bit more left, a little bit more right, stop, and he fixed the lingi. And I thought, wow, this cannot be. So at night, when nobody watched me, I went and dropped the lead line, and it was spot on by the millimeter. This thing was standing straight, just with Jay Ali eyeballing it. We Sungguh pun tak tak ada pelang. Kita timbal papang tu kita nak jaga dia punya penjuru. Mana? Kita nak sama. Kalau bot tu kita tak jaga, dia penjuru tu ada set lain sebelah mana bot tu akan sangat. Sangat. Capability like that shows a great craftsman. It's 
something in the genes or you, you, you can't learn this. Memang bu 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 kayu ni memang kuat. Dia kalau dari segi dari segi kekuatan lebih lebih kuat timba dulu sebab dipakai kita cari orang Melayu kita buat dia pakai pasok. Pasok tu lebih kuat. Dia kadang dia orang buat buat perin dulu ni dia bergantung pada ber skru saja. Dia contohnya dari luar ni mengikut dah dia belajar dari dulu. Dulu buat buat dari luar. Contohnya dia, orang Melayu dulu contohnya dia kebanyakan dia orang buat ditimba dipanggil timba papan dulu. Dia pasang kong. Contohnya kong kong kemudian kong contohnya perin di kemudian. Dia naik berperingkat-peringkat daripada zaman dulu tapi ada ayah ayah pak cik pandai juga buat buat print dulu. Pasal dia ada belajar dulu dengan katanya dia pernah bekerja dengan Jepun. After 20 years, the Naga Pelangi 1, which was a very basic boat with only a poop deck and not fittingly a comfortable home on sea, was understandably getting older. The Naga Palangi One was sold to a new owner, but Swoboda was resolute to continue the legacy of the Naga Palangi, and thus he decided to build a new traditional wooden sailboat, which he fondly named Naga Palangi Two. And who was more fitting to build and construct the new boat, if not Pa Hassan, the son of the late Che Ali? Naga Palangi II is the other type of boat that the Trangano people traditionally built. It is the, what I usually call their flagship, it's the Pinas. So I built a Pinas of about uh, 70 over feet, which is the biggest Pinas that has been built since the Second World War. And she's built of 50 tons of Chengal. The whole boat is solid Chengal except for the deck. The deck we use teak because it has some light, light advantages over Chengal. And uh, she is junk rigged like the first Naga Pelangi. And well, she's, she's the essence of my experience of 20 years of sailing. Wherever the Naga Pelangi appears with the sails up, she's the focus of the attention. She's a beauty and she's. Uh, built to last a hundred years. She's the most safe boat in all weather. Could go around the world non-stop if need be. We feel very comfortable and safe. She's, she's a big boat. Huh? She's much bigger than a fa family normally needs. But, uh, well, we feel very happy and we feel very honored to have a boat built to this high quality by my friends in Duyong. All my knowledge flew into the building and all my heart flew into the building and all my efforts. Four years we have been building on this boat and now it is the home for me and my wife and we are trying to establish the boat as a charter boat. We are here in Langkawi where we are trying to make it popular to sail on Malay built boats, to sail the prow yacht, not the European plastic Tupperware boats, but to sail a classic wooden vessel built to the highest quality by the craftsmen, the last surviving craftsmen of Duyong. That is what the Naga Pelangi is all about. The Malayo-Polynesian ancient seafaring brilliance may be the element that made possible the historic migration and the peopling of insular Southeast Asia, Melanesia, all the Pacific Islands and Madagascar. Whatever theories have been presented, discussed, and argued might not be conclusive of the origin of the humans or the Malayo-Austronesian language. But the fact is that without the seafaring capabilities that these people possessed, there are no theories at all. Today, the seafaring skills the boat building technology and the lost art of non-instrument navigation is a world heritage. It is owned not by any one race, but by all the peoples of the earth. 
without the effort of all, this heritage would be lost forever. Knowledge and skills of master builders like the late Pat Hassan, who built the Borobudur ship, the late Cha'ali, who built the Naga Palangi One, and the Hokalea master navigator, the late Mao Pialyu, will be lost without the effort and passion of individuals like Beal, Swoboda, Herb Kone, and many others, who are committed to the continuity of the preservation of this heritage. Today, we have new generations of master boat builders like Pa'azni and his son Asmawi, and master navigators in Nainoa Thompson and the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and many more who now believe in the preservation of the heritage that will eventually drive us all, not just the Malayo Polynesians, but the whole world to unite and become one. The Malayo Polynesian ancient seafaring people may have been driven both by the desire to explore and for survival, but never by greed. And with their deep spiritual beliefs, they have braved the seas and the oceans throughout much of history. As fanciful as this may sound, countless historians, archaeologists, antiquarians and others have interpreted existing evidence and have always come to the conclusion that it was this knowledge and technology and the daringness of this seafaring race that has made human migration, particularly out of insular Southeast Asia into the Pacific, possible. The journey of the great Malayo-Polynesian ancient seafarers can never be doubted or disputed. And with their vast knowledge of navigation and their seaworthy boats, they have been able to conquer the oceans long before any other explorers. And to the ocean shall we return to again explore the unknown and shape the world as we are tied to the ocean whence we have come from.